thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thanks to all who have been involved in this, uh, Joe Marie and all the colleagues who've put this, uh, this uh, multi-dimensional report together. Um, I work at the Commonwealth where we have 45 developing countries from a range of regions, a range of uh, different types of countries. We have 32 that are small countries, small states. We have 15 LDCs. We've got five G20 members. So we've got sort of microcosm of the world, but a big microcosm. And so when we're doing development work, we see through a variety of lenses uh, the types of challenges that member countries face. So when I see this report, I'm immediately attracted to it and want to congratulate those who've done it um, for a variety of reasons, which I want to just mention in a moment. Um, uh, one particular value of this is the cross-focus cross among a range of different institutions that are uh, in at the center of global governance, in loosely in finance. Uh, and the elements that have been chosen, transparency, accountability, inclusiveness, responsibility, and impact, really are a very valuable cluster. And I find the report itself very helpful because of its <coughs> simplicity. I won't comment on the methodology itself um, in detail, but it's, it's a simple, easy enough to understand approach. Uh, and it then allows the ability to both link and to cross compare, which I think is a very attractive feature of this. Uh, going forward, as you develop further annual reports of this nature, if, which I very much hope you will do, um, I think that will emerge as a very important quality of the uh, reporting um, uh, framework itself. This type of report is, uh, this is not a cluster of individual reports in some sense. There, there are many interlinkages, and the methodology <coughs> is common to all. So I see this as going beyond the sum of the parts, and which is why I feel very attracted to it. It's essential for all the types of developing countries that certainly I deal with in the Commonwealth, in the development uh, sphere. But it's particularly valuable for the poorest and the smallest and most vulnerable countries. Why is that? It's because <coughs> a failure in one part of the governance architecture can be acceptable, perhaps that's not the right word, but can be, uh, a, can be surmountable if you are a country which has resilience and which does not suffer from an acute range of vulnerabilities. But if you are small and you're remote and you have uh, uh, undiversified uh, uh, econ economic base and you lack access to finance and you lack access to trade and you lack access to capacity and resources and you don't know how to get them, you have no concessionality, which is a bundle of things that we deal with. Um, one failure in one area of governance, in finance alone, <coughs> can have ca catastrophic effects right across <coughs> the spectrum. Now, putting all of these together is both a scary thing when you can contemplate that, but it's also a very valuable <coughs> one because you can start pinpointing and teasing out where the catalytic chain can unravel itself <coughs> in a virtuous way to help these types of countries. But if I were to look at an FSB governance report and an IMF one and a World Bank one separately, without a common methodology, I wouldn't have that ability. Um, there are other aspects of the... Um, of the report, which I think are uh, valuable and should uh, perhaps play out in, in future renditions, if I may mention. In the Commonwealth, we've looked uh, at the issue of accountability and governance over a number of years of international institutions. We had a statement issued by Commonwealth leaders, the 50, at that time 54 leaders, called the Marlborough House Statement. That was issued in 2008. We're pleased to know that the five issues that you've picked are all absolutely at the center of a governance statement on the reform of international institutions. What should guide the principles of, uh, that underpin reform? Transparency, accountability, inclusiveness, uh, responsibility, and, Im and impact. But there were other elements which I just wanted to mention, uh, perhaps which could, uh, could go into further rounds uh, as this develops. Uh, one was a very much more explicit treatment of the issue of um, legitimacy, equal voice, fair representation is a more direct sort of insertion on this issue. Because you can be small, but you can be really small, or you can have really very, very little voice. And having a, a better spread of understanding about just how marginalized some countries and regions are is, is quite valuable. Um, flexibility in the governance institutions and their ability to respond to challenges as they come is very much part of the effectiveness of these uh, institutions. And if their governance is such that it does not allow for flexibility, that really is very damaging. In the countries that we deal with, 
shocks are a critical fact of life. And the scale of shocks can reach 200% of GDP in a single event. Now, if institutions are not flexible with, the institu with their instruments, with their pr uh, the nature of the disbursement, the conditionality, uh, the structure of products, that itself is a failure of governance. And <coughs> focusing a little stronger on that would be useful. The second area um, of accountability and, and uh, uh, governance that we focus on is actually with the G20. And perhaps at some point um, today or at the later time, Dirk will say more about that. But we've worked with the ODI and with Dirk to produce um, some material for the G20 itself to help itself as a G20 understand <coughs> its uh, effectiveness as an institution dealing in the development sphere. And we did surveys, uh, and uh, we're happy to share that uh, with Joe Marie and colleagues, mm -hmm. the kinds of surveys asking the kinds of questions about whether the G20 does have an impact in development. Came up with some really quite revealing answers about where it fails and where it succeeds and what needs to be done. And shared that with the G20, and it all went into their accountability report at St. Petersburg, sorry. Um, so now, um, just two or three other short points. Um, one other value of this is not only a mechanism to record effectiveness of governance structures and to reflect the past, but it's also to try to help shape the way these institutions mm -hmm. respond in the future. And in one area, uh, the critical word there is finance. In one area, there is a critical job that this type of report can do going forward. It's in actually teasing out and catalyzing access to finance for development uh, by those countries that need it. And there are three things in this uh, challenge that somehow need perhaps to be pinpointed maybe in the way of the questions themselves in the future. This is not a failing. This is me wanting to be very ambitious in seeing how dramatically impactful this kind of report can be for the types of countries we deal with. The one is the challenge of scale. Today we talk of trillions. About five years ago, we were scared to use the B word, billions, but it's, it just slips off the lips now. In anything, it's a billion dollar tag or a trillion dollar tag, infrastructure, biodiversity loss, climate change, the scale of indebtedness of middle income countries that don't have access to finance, the MDGs, the cost of the post-2015 framework. These are all millions and billions and trillions. So scale needs to come into the accountability and governance issue. The connectivity. If you're talking about water, you're therefore talking about land, you're talking about climate change, you're talking about energy, you're talking about security. So if they're trying to deal with all these things, as they say they are, uh, then the connectivity of the institutions <coughs> and their governance frameworks and their responsiveness collectively needs to come out a bit more. I mentioned the issue of shocks. One last thing, if I may. Going forward in further versions of the report, it would be very helpful to add three or four cogs to this, chapters, trade. We can't talk about governance in international financial architecture without bringing trade in, WTO governance, nor climate and environment. Now, that's a spaghetti bowl. I don't know how you'll manage that, but if you can have some tracking of governance environmentally. And then the SDG issue, the governance of sustainable development governance. That's about, it's a mouthful, but that's the reality. That's the governance that the small countries are dealing with. And finally, we have MDG 8, Global Partnership for Development. Here are four or five partners. But in the next version, perhaps as a chapter or something of that kind, some look at how is this Global Partnership for Development, which never happened in the MDGs, actually being delivered through... Um, uh, through these types of institutions, because if it isn't, that's a failure of governance itself. Sorry to drone. Cyrus, thank you so much. And that, that was great. And I think a lot of these issues will come up in a discussion as well.